Hi, evening, good people. Uh, Insights with Papa Masa welcomes you back. So, um, I was looking at a YouTube channel called Divine Tales, and I found something really interesting about the origin of Buddhism, and that is what I want to share with us today. So, uh, maybe uh, before we get to how the whole thing came about, um, let's look at quick facts about Buddhism. So, um, the religion is uh, classified among the top five religions in the whole world, and uh, over 500 million people today practice the religion. The religion was founded in uh, northeastern India by somebody called Siddhartha Gautama in uh, the 6th century uh, BC. One of the principles of Buddhism is that uh, it denies a supreme deity, meaning that uh, according to Buddhism there is no supreme being because it stresses that anyone or everyone through a concerted individual effort and action can achieve enlightenment. And so um, they have uh, four main uh, pilgrimage centers and one of them is uh, Lumbini and uh, this is where Siddhartha Gautama was born. So that is Lumbini. We also also have a place that is called Bodhgaya. Bodhgaya is where he received the enlightenment so we shall talk about uh, that in the course uh, of time. And then we also have a place that is called Deer Park in uh, Varanasi and at Deer Park this is where he preached his first sermon after he got enlightenment and then the last place is Kushinara and this is where Siddhartha Gautama died. So those are the four pilgrimage areas. Um, amongst the Buddhists. And so um, the story goes that um, Gautama was born of rulers and his mother, her name was Queen Maya, uh, she had a vision while she was sleeping. An elephant, which was uh, as white as pearl, entered her bedroom on the night of his conception. It laid its trunk on her. So she gave birth nine months later on her way to her family's home and she felt absolutely no pain. It is believed that from the time of uh, Siddhartha's birth, um, the child was fully aware and uh, said that he was born to reach enlightenment. And so he was given the name Siddhartha Gautama. Wise Brahmans came to visit the child and they actually proclaimed that the child would uh, either be a great king or he would renounce the world. However, his father, who was King Suredana, did not like the possibility of his son renouncing the world because he wanted an heir, you know, someone who would inherit him and be so great a king like he was. So what he did is uh, he gave his son a luxurious palace, he sealed it off from the world and he provided him with every delight that he'd wish for. At the age of 16, uh, Siddhartha married somebody called Yasudara and together they had a son and they named the son Rahula. Life seemed so perfect until years later when curiosity led him to the world outside the palace gates. And um, while he was there, he was able to witness the suffering of the real world, meaning that he was able to see the old, he was able to see the sick and saw a dead man. Remember, he was sealed off from all these things, meaning that all the old people who were working for his dad <coughs> were, were taken out of work and so they were replaced with younger people. And so he didn't uh, know any uh, suffering in the outside world so to him everything was just perfect and so at the age of 29 he renounced his old life and uh, chose to live by arms and he practiced yoga and also he started existing as an ascetic an ascetic is a person who is uh, characterized by severe self-discipline and also abstention from almost all forms of indulgence and uh, it's always typically for religious reasons and so he became an ascetic because he wanted to understand the world of suffering and somehow find a way out of suffering and so he later abandoned the ways of the ascetic because he felt like he needed to go into deeper meditation uh, than he had attained in his youth. And uh, um, he recalled seeing other beings dying and being born due to uh, relentless ravages of karma, like the belief in karma, like what you give to the world, that is what you receive. And during his meditation, <laughs> you know, just like, uh, you know, these things to attain them is not easy. So when when you are really determined to do something, there's always something that comes like um, comes like a temptation. So he also had a temptation because you're told that there is a demon um, and the name of the demon was King Mara. So the demon, aware that uh, Siddhartha was nearing enlightenment, which was his objective, he decided to attack him and tempted him with his uh, demonic daughters. But uh, luckily Siddhartha didn't give in, and so he stayed strong. So finally, uh, Siddhartha reached enlightenment. Uh, that is, he achieved what in Buddhism they called Nirvana. And so he achieved uh, Nirvana without death. So he was the first person 
person actually to achieve nirvana so um he then became the buddha buddha means the enlightened one and he was a being who had uh, come to the ultimate understanding alone and that was at a time when the world had forgotten about enlightenment and uh, at that time when he received enlightenment uh, he came to realize that anybody could actually reach nirvana or other en enlightenment and so um, he found his ascetic friends the ones that uh, I think they were five the ones that he had before when he abandoned them when he went into deeper meditation and uh, it was at Deer Park where he had his first preaching so that is how the, the religion came about so I've given you the story of Buddha so there are four noble truths uh, in uh, Buddhism. Noble truths are the basis of Buddhism. The first noble truth is life is suffering. Oh, wait, wait. I know this sounds dark, but it's actually not. The actual first truth is that life is dukkha, which is an ancient Sanskrit word that normally translates to suffering in English, but it's more like dissatisfaction. Life will always be dissatisfying because humans cling to temporary things. Knowing about old age, sickness and death, that's dukkha. Things changing when you don't want them to change, that's dukkha. Not getting what you want, that's also dukkha. And things never measuring up to your expectations, that's also dukkha. Dukkha suggests that even when life is not physically painful, it can be disappointing and unfulfilling. The second noble truth is that dukkha is caused by desire. Humans desire and cling to possessions, people, power and life itself. So they end up constantly disappointed because all of those things end. People want things they don't currently have and want things they currently have to never change. But everything is always changing. Everything we think we already own is really borrowed. We want to live forever and we want our loved ones to stay the same forever. But the secret of a happy life is to enjoy what you have without attachment and to not want what you don't have. The third, since we cause our own suffering, we can also cure it. You can't change the things that happen to you, but you can change your responses. A fourth noble truth is that the Buddha's Noble Eightfold Path leads to the end of suffering. The Noble Eightfold Path, or the Middle Way, is an eight-step guide to deprogramming the desire-addicted brain. It might be called a path, but you should think of it more as a wheel with eight spokes that you spin all together. The eight parts are right view. Right view is accepting the four noble truths, that suffering exists and that by following the Buddha's teachings, there is a way out of it. Right thought. The Buddha said that your worst enemy cannot harm you as much as your own thoughts. Don't let negative thoughts like greed, fear and anxiety cloud your mind. Fill your mind with positive ones like love, kindness and compassion. Right speech. Focus on positive words and stay away from negative ones like gossip, hurtful words and lies. These only cause yourself and others to suffer. Right action. The Buddha taught the philosophy of ahimsa or non-violence. Instead of hurting others with your actions, you should try and have an endless love for all life. Good actions include conquering anger with love, evil with good, meanness with generosity, lies with truth. Bad actions include killing, stealing, drugs and engaging in non-consensual sex. Right livelihood. Avoid jobs that involve death, weapons, slavery, the harm of animals, drugs and any kind of exploitation. But livelihood isn't just occupation. Be an honest and kind parent, friend and partner. The next three are related to meditation. You have right effort. Right effort builds on right thought. It means putting effort into welcoming and creating good thoughts and pushing out bad thoughts. Violence, hatred, greed and anxiety all begin as negative thoughts. Using right effort in your little mind garden, you water your positive thought flowers so they grow. And in a garden full of kind and compassionate thoughts, greed weeds will find no space to grow. Right Mindfulness Mindfulness is paying pure attention in every moment. Remaining in the present without judging or labeling your experiences and without letting distracting thoughts bring you out of the present. Mindfulness helps you understand your mind and body so you can see what causes positive and negative reactions from you in each moment. Right concentration. While mindfulness is like a giant net catching everything, right concentration is like a laser. 
Right concentration is what people would recognize as meditation. Using right concentration, you focus your mind on a single thing while meditating, whether that be your breath or thoughts. The point is to focus on that one thing without distraction so you gain insight into reality. Concentration gives you insight into your thoughts and why they happen. So you can just nip them in the bud before you start desiring. By following this noble eightfold path, you can reach Nirvana, the state of enlightenment that the Buddha reached under that tree. You reach Nirvana when you extinguish all wants and desires.